Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast. The first question is, can you explain the concept of Kriya and Kativ and how our sages approach textual variants? And what do we make of the slight differences between all the ancient Torah scrolls that have been discovered? First, a word about just the definition of a, a Kriyuk Siv. Uh, and then I really want to actually approach the question first talking about textual variants and then talk about Kreuksiv, if in fact it is at all related. Uh, the term Kreuksiv uh, really in some ways should be Ksivu Kre, that the text is written one way and it's read differently. Uh, some, the, the original uh, way that a Kreuksiv was marked, uh, for those who might not, some, some might have seen uh, a Masoretic Codex, which is the way the first I would call Panachs before there was printing were written uh, with typically three column pages. And, uh, and you had the text uh, and eventually the text looked like our text with dots with the Kudot, the vowels and the truck and some other things as well. And what a Ksiv and Cray was would be that if a word was written one way but it was read differently. So what the Bali Masora, the Masoretes who sort of created these texts would do is they would write the letters of the Ksiv, that, that's the part that was written, but the vowels they would put underneath would be the vowels of what you were actually going to read. And that is the way it was originally done. Not all printings do it that way today. For example, if you look in the Koreng text, so there, they don't print anything under the letters. They, they, don't, they just print the letters of the Ksiv and they don't put any vowels and in the margin, they, they put the, uh, the, the cray, they, it's actually read, but in the original Masoretic Codices, they would put the letters, the dots, the letters of the ksiv, the dots of the, uh, of the way it was read, and in the margin, it would have a little thing, it would say kuf, which means read, cray, read it the following, and they would tell you the actual word that was read. Um, one of my favorite trivia questions to ask is, which is the most common cray ksiv in all of Tanakh? And the answer to that question is something that will, I think, sort of drive home the point of how he described the original Kreuk Siv, which is it's the Shem Havaya. It's God's uh, the four-letter name. And if you think about it, everybody has probably noticed that the, the vowels in it are Shvacholam and Kamats. Uh, and there's a, a group of Christians who call themselves the Jehovah's Witnesses. And you might be surprised that I would pronounce the word that way. And the reason I do is because they didn't understand that that's not the way the word is actually pronounced. We don't know for sure how it's pronounced, but actually those are the vowels of a, do, and noi, meaning the shva is a chat, a, a, uh, and the cholam, and the kamat. And when in fact the shem havaya, the yud kei ke, is read elokim, so there the vowels are shva for the chat of segol, then cholam, for the elo, and then it's a chirik under the last, under the vav, not the kamats that you usually get. So that really is a classic kreyuk siv because you, well, the way we, even, even, even a Korean text does it that way, which is that you print the letters yud ke bav ke, you print the vowels that we actually pronounce. Uh, and, uh, and so that is, and in fact, you know that that's a kreyuk siv because the Gemara and Kiddushin, uh, Quoting the Pasuk in Parsha Shmos, Zeshmi la Olam, Vizezhri la Dordar, Kurdish Baruch, who tells Moshe that this is the way my name is pronounced, and, and this is my name really is. So, uh, and Chazal have a tradition, Zezhri, uh, Zeshmi la Olam, Le'alein, you read it to, to conceal it because we don't pronounce God's name uh, the way it's written. So, Chazal comment there, Lo Kemosha Ani Nichtav Ani Nikra. The way I am written is not the way I'm read, which is ksiv and kray. There also happens to be uh, something called a ksiv velo kray and a kray velo ksiv. They're pretty rare. You can find examples of each in Megil Asurus, where you have a word not written at all. I think the word elai is not written. Ki amar elai al So the text has just a blank. There are no letters, but there are vowels of the word elai. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, a few examples again in Tanakh, and there's one in Megil Asurus, where you have a word that's written, but it's not pronounced at all. It's not that it's pronounced differently, but it's not pronounced at all. So I'll come back to talk a little bit later about what is the origin of Kreyak Siv, or what are the theories about the origin of Kreyak Siv. But I wanted to talk about the, the other question of textual variants. I, I want to tell a, sort of a personal story. I was uh, probably 15 and I was learning, I went to Yeshiva Day School, but I was starting to learn on my own, really, besides what we were doing in school. And I was reading Parshish, I was doing Chumash and Rashi, and I got Parshish Truma. And there's a Rashi there on the on the uh, 
on the Pasuk, Beis Kol Asher Atzavel Sval B'nei Yisrael. It's the last Pasuk sort of in the, in the section that deals with the Aron and its Kapores. And Rashi has a very strange comment there on Ace Kol Asher Atzavel Sval B'nei Yisrael. Rashi writes, it's a Vav Yisera. It's an extra Vav. And he gives an example like the Eilev and Eitz Sivon, Ve'ayavano. And I couldn't understand what Rashi was talking about because the Pasuk made perfect sense. I don't know what Vav Rashi is talking about. I think when I was that age, I didn't have a box to even put this idea in. I didn't have a box in my mind that would it be possible that Rashi, in fact, had a different text in front of him than we do. And mm-hmm. if I even just paid attention to the Dibur Maschal Rashi, it says, which is not what we have printed in our Hamashim and our Sifrei Torah. It turns out that Rashi and I think Cheskuni and Ibn Ezra all had this Vav in their Sifrei Torah. And, and once you have the Vav there, you understand why the Vav doesn't make sense there. The Vav doesn't really belong there. It's an ex Vav you say, that's what Rashi says. So when I first encountered this phenomenon, this question of there being more than one possible Torah text, in fact, more, more relevant here that Chazal might have had a text that's different than, uh, than, than ours. So I, I simply, I didn't have that category in my head and it didn't mean anything to the time. I didn't understand what Rashi was talking about. It wasn't the only Rashi I didn't understand, but I moved on from there. Um, but later I discovered, uh, as a student, really as a teacher, um, uh, that there's a long history to this particular question, uh, speaking simply within the tradition. There are There is certainly a separate issue that I want to really address at length um, of, I'll call it, other texts of or other versions of Torah existing in non-rabbinic literature, whether you talk about the scrolls of Qumran, uh, when we talk about some of the ancient translations, and in fact, not only the ancient translations, but even sometimes our Aramaic, our Jewish Aramaic Targumim, seem to be translating a text that's different than the one that we have. Uh, in many, many, many cases, or most cases, it has nothing to do with their having what we call a different forlaga, different underlying text. It has to do with translation. But sometimes it actually, it is pretty clear that they were translating something different. And sometimes there's very strong evidence that they had uh, different texts. It's not, it's, it's the rare, rare, it's the less common option, but it happens occasionally, even in, even in Jewish, the Jewish Aramaic Targumim, like Old was pretty rarely, but sometimes the other Aramaic Targumim that we do have, you will occasionally find such a thing. But I want to really focus my comments even really narrowly within the tradition. Uh, and it really begins uh, with a passage that's found actually four times. It's the same passage in rabbinic literature. Um, I'll, you know, the one I'll, I'll focus on, but it's really all the same contents, is a passage in the Sifrei, the Medrash Halacha, the Medrash Tanoim, on Sefer Tvarim, and it comes up at the way end of the Torah. And that is on the Pasuk of Meona Eloke Kedem. So on the word Meona, the Sifrei comments the following, that there were Gimel Sifrei Torah and Subazar, with were three Sarim, three different Sifrei Torah found in the Azara, and these were probably official Sifrei Torah. They were probably the things that people would compare against. There, there's an allusion to this in the Mishnah Moed Katan, that you're not allowed to fix a letter, in, even one letter in a Sefer Torah. Afilu B'Sefer, the correct version of the Mishnah should be Sefer HaAzara, not Sefer Ezra. Um, so, so as important as the text was, the Mishnah there says you're not allowed to amend it, fix it on, on, on Halamoid. But um, it, anyway, the, 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 Tosef, the, the uh, Sifrei speaks of these three Sifrei Torah, and each one had a name. And the reason why each one had a name, the three names were Sefer Ma'on, Sefer Hihi, and Sefer Zatutim. And the reason for these three names is that each of these Sifrei Torah had one reading that was different than the other two. So, for example, the word Ma'ona, I don't know how it was pronounced, but one of the three Sarm had no hay at the end. Mm. It, may, it might have been pronounced the same way because you pronounce it, you know, the kamats without a uh, at the end. But one of the svarim was written ma'on, and two of them were written ma'ona. And the sifre says that they were that they were vatal the echad and they kept the shnai, meaning they followed a majority, a rove, and they determined the correct text was ma'ona. And then uh, another sefer a hat was called hihi because the word he is. Many Bali Kriya know that one of the most frustrating, maybe the most frustrating word in the Torah is the word he and who, because almost all the time, with, with a number of exceptions, I'll, I'll mention in a moment, the word he is written with a vav. It's really only in Chomish, uh, and it's very frustrating for Bali Kriya because you never know whether it's he or who. And two of the Svarim had 11 he's with a yud, and one of them had nine. And so that one with the odd that only had nine keys with a yod was called Sefer Hihi. And then the last Sefer really was the same thing. It was a couple of places where there was a different word. Zatutim, 
instead of uh, Na'are and Atzile at the end of uh, Parshas Mishpat. So each Sefer had its own distinct reading. And in all three cases, the Sifrei tells us that they were Mekayim, the Shnaim, and Mavat Aliyacha. They accepted the majority readings too of the two Sfarim, and they did away with the uh, with so, the third reading. So let me just uh, interject, because there's one thing I want clarity on. I've seen people point to this Sifri where they say, oh, you see, there's different versions of the Torah, but the way you're explaining it is that the differences are just a few letters. It's not It's not differences like Psukim or, you know. It's not no, they're, they're, I, I would say that when you're talking about anything in rabbinic literature and all of the examples that I, I will refer to, uh, we're, you're talking about a very. You're talking about things that, uh, in terms of to an outside observer, are 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 minimal, almost no 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 meaning, uh, right? Whether the he was whether you had nine he's or eleven he's, it's not a it changes not the slightest thing about the meaning of of, of the text. Neither does my own or my own um, So yes, the, 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 most of the difference. If you're talking about internal to rabbinic literature, it's very rare to have a variant of significant impact. Uh, the min, in fact, there's a minchas chinuch on the mitzvah Ksiva Sefer Torah, the last mitzvah, who, who, who asserts that whenever you have a difference, something, uh, when you have a, a change in a sefer which doesn't affect the meaning, like a malay b'chaser, so the minchas chinuch says that if there's no halacha in chazal that is tied to that particular thing, he thinks it doesn't invalidate a sefer Torah, because we have some significant examples of that. Again, things that to the ordinary reader would say Mabakach, like what's the big deal about it? It's okay, he with a Vav versus a Yud. Obviously, we, we take every letter in the Torah as important. They don't want to minimize Chas Vashelm. It's, it's metaphysical significance, but certainly we wouldn't call these substantive differences. Right. Now, the th this particular issue uh, makes an appearance in the Gemara uh, in the in Shabbos Dathun Hamid Beis, and there... The Gemara is talking about the sins or the sin of B'nai Eli, of Chafni and Pinchas. And the Gemara is claiming that really only one of them sinned, not the other. And in, in trying to sort of explain away certain passages, which are in the plural, um, the Gemara quotes the word Ma'avirim. Uh, um, and the response to that of the Gemara when challenging, that, that that's a plural verb. The Gemara says, yes, it's a, the way we have it reads in our text, even though it's a plural verb, but it's written ma'avi ram. It's written without the last yud, but without the second yud. So even though it, yes, it's technically plural, it's written chaser the yud because this hints to us that it was really only one of them. It wasn't both of them. The problem that arises is that in our Masoretic texts that we have inherited, the word ma'avi rim has a yud at the end, and the, the latter yud, the, the yud that's the plural marker in biblical Hebrew. So Rashi is bothered by something else in the Gemara as well, and he sort of erases, he says this passage is in error, and Rashi points out that 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 the Masoretic text and uh, what we call the Masoretic lists uh, that were published of odd features of words, Rashi says this word is not there. So obviously the whole Gemara is in error. That's the way Rashi handles at least this example. Tostos, however, comes along and says, Hashas shalanu cholek al sfarim shalom. The, our Gemara here argues has a different text than our sfarim because our sfarim, what Tosus means, our sfarim means Masoretic texts. So our sfarim have a yud, and the Gemara obviously didn't have a yud. And Tosus there cites one other example, a very interesting Yerushalmi, uh, where again, what one of the one of the challenges here, and Tosus obviously understood that, but he was living he was living in a pre-print world, is that you can't look at a printed text of a Gemara and see that it's spelled differently and say, ah, you see the Gemara had a different text. That's not true because printers and scribes were very sloppy, especially with things that didn't matter. The only way to be able to reasonably assume that the Gemara might have been operating with a different text or Medrash is operating with a different text is if the contents of the Medrash suggest a different reading, not the actual spelling of the text. So Tosas points to Yerushalmi that uh, Yerushalmi says that uh, that uh, in one place, it says that Shimshon ruled over the Jewish people 20 years. In one place, it says 40 years. And the Yerushalmi's resolution, and you can tell from that that that's actually the correct reading of the Yerushalmi, is that the Plishtim were terrified of Shimshon even after he died for 20 years. They still trembled over Shimshon. So Tosas just cites this as an example. He says in our Sfarim, in both 
both chapters, I think it's chapter 15 and 16 of Sefer Shoftim, it says that he judged the Jewish people for 20 years. It says 20 in both cases. So Tosis just leaves it at that. Tosis doesn't get bent out of shape. Tosis just makes that observation. In what I think might be, I've never, I haven't systematically studied this, but perhaps the longest Gilion Hashas, or Kibager, in Shas, running down like a large chunk of the page and going into the wide lines, Rabbi Kiva Eger collects a whole list of these where you have Midrashim, occasionally Gemaras, which seem to be darshaning a different text. The two perhaps most famous examples, because people, you encounter them if you do Shnai Mikrach Targum, you do Narashi, is number one, Pilag Shim Asherli Avraham, the son of Ramathanos. So Rashi quotes a Medrash there that, that Ketura was in fact Hagar. They were the same person. Right. And now the problem is it says Pilag Shim, plural. So the Medra says it's Pilag, shim, pilag Sham Ksit. Uh, and the other one is Vayihi Biyom Kalos Moshe Lokimes Amishkan, where Rashi says that the Kla Yisrael on the day that the Mishkan was set up was like a Kala Hanichneses Lechupa. And that's why it's written Kalas uh, Moshe. Now the problem that confronts everybody, and this is this is not Rashi's comment, they're both Midrashim. I suspect both are from the Medrash Rabbah and their respective books. The problem is that our text has Pilag Shim with a Yud at the end, and it has Kalos written with a Vav. So there are some commentaries of, on Rashi who try to sort of explain away the, this difference and say, no, it really wasn't the different text. This, But if you just look at the Chuvah of the Rashba and the Ran Lishchidushim on Sanhedrin, I think it's that valid, they both cite these as, I, I, I believe the Ran cites it, the Rashba I know for sure does, cites these as examples where, where clearly the Gemara or the Medrash had a different text than we happen to have. And the, the Gemara in Sanhedrin speaks about, without going into the details, it speaks about the spelling of the word karnos in the three sections at the end of Vayikra Perik Dalid, the three chataos of, uh, of private individuals. And there, the Gemara makes it very clear that two of them are written chaservav, karnas, and one of them is written Malevav, with the Vav, Karnos. All are, of course, red Karnos. And there's a debate between Beishamai and Beishil, the Gemara tries to explain based upon whether you follow the writing, the written text, or the way the text is actually read, the, the, the reading tradition. So the Ran points out there that clearly the Gemara had two of the Karnos is without a Vav and one with. But in our Sefer Torah, go open any Sefer Torah in your Shul's own Kodesh, and all three are lacking the Vav. And that, they just point that out. Um, the question, of course, th there are two questions that are, are raised by this. Um, assuming one accepts that there are different texts, uh, there, there is a strain, I think it's a minority strain in tradition, uh, that really seeks to explain away any differences and claim that there were none. The most prominent proponent of this in the 20th century uh, was Rav Chaim Hellerzell who strove greatly to, uh, to, to try to claim that, I, I don't know, everything, but try to explain away most of these differences as not being really, they didn't really have a different text. And again, this has roots. There are achronim who, who are commentaries on Rashi who try to do this. Um, and it may go back a little bit earlier, but I think the predominant approach among we shown them is just to acknowledge it exists uh, and they don't seem to get uh, worked up over it. Now, the, the question is, what do you do? So when you have clearly the Sifre, when you talk about something, I have three Sifrei Torah, which are my authoritative sources. So we apply the general halachic principle of Achrei Rabin Lahatis, you follow a majority. There is, however, a fascinating Tshuva the Rashba. It's, it's doubly fascinating because the Tshuva itself got corrupted in its citation. Uh, but what the Rashba actually said in the Tshuva, and we know this because other Rishonim cite this, the Me'iri and his Kirya Sefer is not the only one, but he cites, not by name, but he's clearly citing the Tshuva the Rashba. The Rashba was asked, what do you do in these cases where there's a difference between the text that the Gemara had or a Medrash had and what our Sfarim has? And again, almost every one of these is Malay B'chaser. Not to minimize the importance of that, but it is, it, is a, it is not a significant substantive difference. So the Rashba says that it depends. If there is a halacha that is learned from the spelling of this word, then what the Rashba actually said is that you change our text to match that which the Gemara had. If, however, there's no halacha being learned from it, then you leave the text alone. And what happened to this Chuba the Rashba is that it got corrupted, a, a line fell out. And when it was quoted by the Mincha Shai, who's one of the sort of great, uh, I say, Achronim as an authority on Masorah, 
the Minchashai cites this tshuva, I, he cites it, I think, as a tshuva of the Ramban, but the, the tshuva of the Ramban, most of the tshuva of the Ramban are actually the tshuva of the Rash, but that's well known. So he cites this tshuva of the Ramban to say, we don't change our sar, period. Period, full stop. And, and eventually this worked its way into the Keses HaSofer, uh, which is the sort of Sofrim's uh, halacha work, at least in Ashkenaz. And he quotes the Minchashai as, as, as with this version of the Rashba's tshuva, and so that's where that's where it sort of is. Nobody changes uh, our svarim, even if it seems clear that Chazal had a different uh, different spelling. Uh, and and one could one could uh, debate and discuss why that came to be and whether that makes sense. But that in fact is the reality of what any way any sefer Torah is with today. We do not change our svarim, even if we find that Chazal. It seems clear that Chazal had a particular text. There's the, the one question that that may arise for some. I think many people have asked this question is, what does this mean theologically? And there is a sort of a backstory to that question. Uh, the, it's a theological question because people say, what about the Rambam's eighth Bikar? What about the Rambam's eighth principle of faith in which he says that, well, question what he actually says, but the way it's often popularly quoted as the safer Torah that we have is the exact safer Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu uh, gave us. But he himself and, was he himself was correcting uh, Sifri Torah in the in for the Yemenis. Yeah. Well, the, the Rambam, the Rambam himself. So, so, so this this is really an interesting question. How does one how does one grapple with the Rambam's Eifikar? Now, you could say that many of the Rishonim simply didn't agree with the Rambam in terms of the scope of Eifikar, but I think it's worth commenting just for a couple of minutes about what the Rambam actually does say in the Eifikar uh, and what he perhaps means. The most extensive exposition of the Rambam's 13 principles faith and the original one actually is in the Perish HaMishnayis, his commentary to the Mishnah in the 10th or 11th parak of Sanhedrin, depends whether you're looking at the Bavli or the Mishnah, it's really the uh, 10th parak of Sanhedrin, Perich Chela. And the Rambam there has a lengthy exposition on a number of topics, but one of them he lays out in fuller form his 13 principles of faith. In Hilchos Tshuva, in the Mishnah Torah, he has a much more sort of abridged version, not presented as one through 13, but they pretty much all get incorporated there. Now, the t if you look at the text of the Rambam in almost any edition, any of the printed editions, with the exception of Rav Kapach, the Moser Rav Kuk, the Rambam actually says nothing about our text being the exact text of Moshe Rabbeinu. And I want to explain what he does say, but I think in the interest of intellectual honesty, um, the Rav Kapach in his edition does have that line where it sounds like the Rambam is saying our text is the exact, exact text, and that line is real. Nobody introduced that in, and we know that because we actually have the Rambam's autograph for the first five uh, Siddharim of his Parashat Mishnayis. We have his copy, his the text of the Mishnah that he wrote, plus his commentary in Judeo Arabic, and that line is there. The Rav Kapach didn't pull that one out of thin air. That's in the original autograph. So you have to grapple with that line. But it's worth thinking about what the Gemara says and what the Rambam actually says in the eighth Ikar. I often ask students when I introduce, introduce this, given what you perceive about the Rambam's eighth Ikar, what proof text do you think that the Rambam quotes at the, at, to try to demonstrate that this is a major principle of faith? The Rambam, whenever he can, tries, tries in his Ikarim to cite a Pasuk that will prove that this is at least one of the Torah's principles. So you would have expected the Rambam would have quoted Vizosa Torah Shasa Moshe of Nebene Israel. Maybe he would quote Vayichto Moshe Satorah Zos, but he actually doesn't. The passage that the Rambam quotes, we read a few weeks ago, was Vizos Te Deun Ki Hashem Shlachani Lasos Eis Kol HaMasim HaEle Kilo Milibi, which is very strange mm -hmm. because that passage is from Parshas Korach, where Moshe's authority and legitimacy has been challenged by Korach. And Moshe introduces the miracle of the earth swallowing up Korach and his men with this statement, that you will know with this, that God has sent me to do all of this. I haven't done anything my own. So you have to ask yourself the question, what does that have to do with the eighth Ikar? Now, when you read the eighth Ikar, leaving out that one line that Rav Kapach correctly puts back in, the Rambam is not talking about our text versus Moshe Rabbeinu's text. The Rambam says that someone, the, the Gemara in Chelak actually says, the Brisa says that, not only someone who says ain't from the but even someone who says that this pasuk, this teva, is not men but Moshe mipi atzma, that Moshe did it on his own. And the Rambam, when he talks about this in the eighth Ikar, he says that this this heretic who who would be in violation of this principle is the person who says, you know what, 
There are things in the Torah that are toch and there are things that are aklipa. There are things that are essential. Those are the things that God told Moshe, like Shema and Anochi Hashem Alkecha. And then there are stories Moshe Rabbeinu wrote on his own. In effect, what, what the Ramam is coming to critique or attack, and I think that's what the Brisa is, is those who would claim that Moshe did things on his own. That whatever Moshe did, not, not everything was told to him or given to him by God. And so the Rambam is, and that's what I think the Bryce is saying, and the Rambam is saying that anybody who says that Moshe did this part on his own is a heretic. And the passage that he quotes is from Parshas Korach. When Korach challenged Moshe, he said, Moshe, you know, you appointed your brother Aaron because you felt like doing it, not because God told you to do it. So that really is the essence of the Eidika. That's the entire discussion, minus that one line. And in Hilchos Tshuva, when the Rambam briefly res- describes this particular form of heresy, of, you know, who's Kofar Batora, the Rambam doesn't mention at all anything about the text. He just quotes the Brisa from Chelek, which read simply is talking about the reliability, the authenticity, uh, and the faithfulness of Moshe Rabbeinu. But it has nothing to do with our particular text versus Moshe Rabbeinu's text. Now, as I said, the Rambam does introduce that one line there, and, the, and he doesn't prove it, and he doesn't discuss it. Uh, some have suggested, I, I won't say who, not because I think they won't own it, but I haven't heard it firsthand from a very, very uh, learned man, a uh, very well-respected scholar who suggested that the reason why the Ramam, the line was there for polemical purposes, uh, and it was aimed against Islamic charges of falsification of, of, of the Torah. And therefore the Ramam was saying, you know, our text is exactly the same text. That's uh, obviously a completely different topic. It's hard to know. It's a, it's speculation. Um, but either one has to say that the other we shown him disagreed very strongly with the Ramam, at least on that particular line, or you have to say the Ramam did not mean it, at least in its most literal form. And as you mentioned before, the Ramam in Hilchos Sefer Torah Tilam Azuzah, when he talks about writing his own Sefer Torah, so he lists for us, I think it's Perachas, he lists for us every Parsha break in the Torah, every Psucha and every Stuma, and he tells you, the reason I'm doing this is because I found such disputes between all the Sarm. No one agrees with one another. And he tells us that he used what we assume to be the Aleppo Codex, the Sefer that Aaron ben Asher, the last of the great Masoretes, edited many, many, many times. And that, he says, that's on the basis that, that, that at the time it wasn't in Aleppo, it was in uh, Cairo. And the Ramam says, that's how I wrote my Sefer Torah. And here is the list of the Parshish that are found there. Um, so that, that's the theological question. And it's a real question. I don't think it's one that should be minimized. But I think that if you put that put the Ramam aside for the moment, I don't think that inherently um, it presents theological uh, issues. I, I think that we shown them with them and bothered because I think that they understood when HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the Torah, it was understood it was going to be transmitted by human beings. And when human beings transmit things, we are human beings. We are not Malach HaSharis. We're not the ministering angels. And so it's inevitable that things can, in fact, creep into a text. And the halacha provides us with a way of resolving a, a conflict resolution mechanism, which is achirat mahatis, you follow a majority. There is, a, there is a, if, I, if I may, um, there are some, you know, who read into, let's say, the Ibn Ezra's comments about the secret of the 12, or you have the Rashi saying that this is maybe a scribal edition, or, or you know, the Gemara talking about how the last few Sukim of the Torah, last eight or twelve, were um, you know written, not written by Moshe. So this idea has been out there, not just for the letters, but actually for a few parts. Yeah. Right. So it's worth noting. It's, it's very clear to me. There are some people. There are there are many interpreters who've understood Ibn, Ibn Ezra as saying quite clearly when he talks about the secret of the twelve. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that's what he's referring to. But keep in mind that the same Ibn Ezra writing about Yitzchaki, we don't know who Yitzchaki was, but at the end of Parshas Vayishlach, uh, says that y- y- Yitzchaki suggested uh, refer- was written later in the days of Yoshafat. And, and Ibn Ezra says, Sarif, which I like to say is the only so- source we have in rabbinic literature for burning works of heresy. The Gemara only says that we burn Sifre Kodesh written by Ovde Avodazara because the assumption that it was the written Lashem Avodazara, but burning, heresy, burning heretical works is not actually in our tradition, except for Ibn Ezra. So Ibn Ezra clearly reacted violently against this suggestion of this entire section. 
So, so yes, I, I don't think that there's any doubt that Ibn Ezra, when he talks about a Kanani Ba'aretz, when he presents two interpretations, when he says, Bim lav sod yudom, I think it's very clear what he means. I mean, there he doesn't take a definitive choice, but when he calls, let's say, an Eilah Advarim, the beginning of Sefer Dvarim, he talks about the Soda Shnei I, I don't doubt that that's what he's talking about. And you have here, you have a Rashi about Tiko and Sofrim, which I think it's clear, and people have tried to, I think, edit out that Rashi. But I, I, I think that this is still what we would call marginal. When you talk right. about percentage-wise, you're talking about, you know, Batel, the, 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 you know, the Rebo or something like that. So um, it, each one sort of raises important questions about how Chazal or Rishonim related to the text, at least at the margins, but I don't think it really provides a significant challenge unless one sort of takes an absolutist position. And it's worth noting, I, I, I've said to my students that when you talk about Ibn Ezra, and what he says about the 12 Sukkim is crystal clear, absolutely clear. And the Ramam, to the extent you can call it a Psach, the Ramam assumes that it, uh, according, assumes the opinion that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote all the last eight Sukkim as well. Uh, but Ibn Ezra is quite explicit that Moshe Rabbeinu did not write the last 12 Sukkim. Uh, the Rambam's family, uh, you know, had great respect for the Ibn Ezra. And the question is, the Rambam wrote what he wrote in the Atikar, and yet, what did he think of Ibn Ezra? Why did he think so highly of him if Ibn Ezra wrote these things? And you're either going to have to say that the Rambam didn't understand them this way, or that the Rambam wasn't bothered by it. And, and, and again, uh, when the, Ibn Ezra starts talking about a sod, you want to claim he really didn't mean what I think he meant? Okay, but you can't really get around that for his adding four psukim on at the end of the Torah, you know, to the to the Gemara's eight. So, so yes, I, I think that th there are other sources within Rishonim uh, who 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 do have certain kinds of comments to this nature. But I, again, I think they are uh, I, marginal, not in the sense that Rishonim or Gedolei Rishonim. But I, I don't. I think these are these are not the significant unless one takes an absolute right. decision. Even, even like, if you want to entertain the idea that the Haknani Az Ba'aretz is, you know, added or something, it still doesn't change what's, you know, the overall picture. That's basically it. That's basically what, it, it goes in line with the Ikar as well, so. Correct. I, I think, firstly, if you take the Ramam's Ikar the way I'm suggesting it, it Moshe Rabbeinu didn't put that, if Moshe Rabbeinu didn't write that line, then, then it, it doesn't violate you know, Moshe Rabbeinu's faithfulness because he didn't put it in. Um, in a way I, that I think it's... the Ikar is actually brilliant, the way he presents it with the whole Korah thing, it's actually beautiful because it's a, pole on one on the one hand, it's a polemic against the claims of the Muslims at the time who were saying that the Torah has changed. And, the, and on the other hand, it can be read in a way that also takes the other view that, you know, the Torah actually, it's pretty, it's 99.9% .9 the same. Right. right. I, I think I don't think any of the Rishonim would have debated the fact that our Torah is 99.9% .9 the same as Moshe Rabbeinu's Torah. You know, those who acknowledge textual variants don't see this as, you know, as significant. And I don't think you occasionally will hear people say, ah, you see Ben Ezra as justification for biblical criticism, uh, uh, certainly higher criticism. And I think Ibn Ezra would be rolling over in his grave and, and hearing that. You want to adopt that position, that's fine. You can't hang it on Ibn Ezra's head. That's not where he was going with this. Great, I'm glad you clarified that because that's something that comes up a lot. Listen, you, you, people can take the stances they want to take and believe what they want or not believe what they want to believe, but it's dishonest to attribute that to Ibn Ezra, right? If again, if you want to, if you want to, if you're coming to contradict an absolutist position that the text is letter for letter, you can find plenty of evidence in Rishonim and Ahronim and in Chazal of that, uh, even if it's not absolutely unanimous. But that in no way suggests that we're talking about what would you call anything resembling higher criticism. Mm -hmm. So let me just come back now to the Kreuksiv where, where we started. Um, the question is, what is the origin of Kreuksiv? And here, there are at least two major opinions in the Rishonim, in commentaries. Uh, there's a debate between Radak and Abarbanel. The Radak is found in his introduction to Nevi'im Rishonim, and the Abarbanel is found in his introduction to Sefer Yirmiyahu. The Radak writes in his introduction that, and he seems to be actually echoing, he doesn't quote it explicitly, he's echoing this fray that I began with, that they found different Sfarim with different versions, and he attributes it to the turmoil of exile. He says when they came back, I think he says in Bayashini, so there was machlokis between the Sfarim, and the Chachamim chose Rove, when they were able to determine the correct text, they did. And otherwise, they chose 
they went after the rove lefidatum. I don't want to talk about what lefidatum means now, but it meant they followed the majority. He seems clearly to be quoting the uh, the sifre, and then he says, so that's he said normally they follow the rove, but if they couldn't determine, they couldn't be machria, then they left one as the kre and one as the ksiv. Meaning what kre ksiv then reflects is two different textual versions, and they didn't know which was right, so they left one as ksiv and one as the kre. So that's where the radak. That's where this sort of uh, segue into our discussion of textual variants. That's where the idea that Craig Siv is reflects a multiple text or or, or a, 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 uh, a a I don't want to call it plur pluralistic, but a a uh, multiple uh, traditions of the text. And this is the way uh, the Bali Mesorah or Chazal preserve uh, both versions. A Barbanel. Took very strong exception to this. He was actually a literalist on the Ramam's Eitikar. And he said, Chas Shalom and the Torah, this is our only comfort in exile, our Torah. And now you're telling me that the Torah itself is not intact, it's got errors and so on. So Abar Benel uh, himself, there kind of ironically, he's trying to explain why there are so many Kreuk Siv disproportionately in Sefer Yirmiyahu, to which he attributes it the way I would formulate it. Yirmiyahu didn't really know how to write so well. Uh, that might That could get some people upset. But the Abarbanel critiques the what's that? Probably worse, you know. <laughs> I, it, it all depends on your, you know, your perspective. Yeah. So the Abarbanel says no. He says that the origin and, and and I should state this at the outset. They might both be correct, and in fact, they might both be wrong in the sense that there's at least one kind of creative which neither of them is correct on. But they probably would acknowledge that. Um, in other words, it may be that some creative could be one, and some creative could be the other, and some could be something totally different. So Abarbanel suggests that what happened was you had over time a change in pronunciation of things. And when Ezra, you know, when they came back and by Shani, you had the different pronunciations, the problem was, well, what do you do? But Ezra wasn't going to change the text. One of the examples I think he cites is Tzfoyim, Admaut Tzfoyim, which is always written, I think, like two yuds, without a vav. So, so Barbanel says that when pronunciation had changed, Ezra wasn't going to touch the text, but the way you, in effect, updated the text was you had a cray. You read it with, the, I think, the more modern pronunciation, but the ksiv preserve what we would say is the original pronunciation and the original text. So there's really no, there's no pagam, there's no defect in the text that the cray ksiv reflects. It just reflects the evolution of pronunciation. And so the cray is the way it's currently read. The ksiv the way, is the way it's always written, but it was once read that way. Now, I mentioned there's a third kind of creative which is clearly not, even if both of them are correct, or if one of them is correct, there's another kind of creative The Gemara at the end of the third parak of Megillah said that mikraus that are ksuvim lignai koronosam l'shvach, that you have certain certain euphemisms that we read. Uh, for example, in the uh, in the Tochacha, Parshas Kisavo, so the, 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 the written text says, isha sares, isha her, yishkolena. We don't read Yishkalena. That seems to be a more explicit reference to the sexual act. So we read instead Yishkalena. That's not a textual variant. And that's not an updating, you know, that the pronunciation changed. That's just for public reading purposes. Or we, I mean, we read it privately that way probably also. We don't want to read it, you know, out of Lashon uh, Nikia, out of speaking, you know, in a, uh, in a cleaner fashion uh, or more polite fashion or a less vulgar fashion. So we don't read the text the way it's written, but that's not Radak. I think I would hope would acknowledge that's not that's not a textual variant, and the Barbanel would also acknowledge that's not an updating. Right. So, also, anyway. also the Torah doesn't really Hebrew language doesn't use vulgarity, so it's not like uh, uh, you know. Well, I mean, the, the truth is the Torah does there, but we don't. We prefer not to read it to read it that way. I mean, there is a famous passage in the Rambam. Many have disputed the Rambam suggests it's called Lashon Hakodesh because the yeah. language doesn't have any words for sexual organs and so on. Um, it, it's it, it's a it's a contention not everybody agreed with, um, mm -hmm. but we certainly have some verbs that are, are are closer and even not on not on on issues relating to sexuality. The references to human waste uh, whenever they appear in Tanakh, uh, there's a kreuk siv. Um, so 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 there's certainly kreuk sivs that have nothing to do with uh, change it, it, with questions of the text or changes changes in in how words are pronounced. It's simply a question of I'll, I'll use the term euphemism. Um, but it's clear what the text is, and, and we just read it differently. So that, that I think, is, uh, you know, that's how Kreuk Siv ties into the larger question. Okay, so there's another thing that, I guess, connects to this, but um, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but there, 
the, the time of, of, of Ezra, the um, Hebrew alphabet was, that was written was um, Ashurit. The new Hebrew that we have today is the Ashurit script. Um, at least there is opinions that that was the case. And then there was an eight more ancient Paleo Hebrew. Um, so how does that factor into all this? So, as you, as you alluded to, the Gemara in Sanhedrin at the end of the second parak quotes three opinions from the Tanaim as to what the original script was and how we wound up with the Assyrian script. But the original script, which the Gemara calls Ksav Ivri, um, so one opinion, Rabbi Yose, and there's another opinion, another Tana also, believe that the Torah was originally given, the original script was Paleo Hebrew, and then it was changed in Ezra's time, where they brought it back from Babel. Uh, there is a second opinion that it was originally given in uh, Savashuri and the Assyrian script, our script. And then when they sinned, I assume that's the Egel. It was then given to them in Ksav Ivri. I'm not sure why that's a punishment exactly. And then later it was changed back to Ksav Ashuri. And there's a third opinion that it was always in Ksav Ashuri. Uh, the, the question, I, I'm not, I'm going to put aside the question of the archaeological evidence. I mean, the archaeological evidence, which doesn't necessarily prove the case, all the inscriptions that have been found, but those are found on hard materials. I, as far as I know, all the inscriptions from the First Temple period happen to be in Ksav Ivri. Um, does that prove anything? I don't know. There may be more than one way to interpret that or explain why that might be. Um, but clearly, it's not so deeply problematic because the Gemara has an, it would just simply conform to one opinion that's found in the Gemara. Uh, the, the only, I'll call it theological question of how, it, how is it that we change, so I, I think there are sort of two ways of approaching this. One of them, uh, which, uh, which my Rebbe Rav Shechter commented on when we learned Sanhedrin, was that the opinion, at least one of the opinions of the Gemara, that the, that the, that the script was changed is based upon uh, a Pasuk. I think it's in Daniel or, or Ezra. Nehemiah, Ksav HaNishtavon. I think it's Daniel. Ksav HaNishtavon. I'm not sure which one it is, but Ksav HaNishtavon, Ksav HaAsud Lishtanos. So there seems to be some tradition already, uh, an oral tradition that the Ksav would be changed or could be changed. Um, so one way of understanding that it was baked into the system, I don't know if it was supposed to be a one-time change or that, or that script can change. The alternative might simply be that the script actually doesn't matter, right? Ksav HaShuri and Ksav Ivri have the same, have the same 22 letters. It doesn't actually change things. Um, one might even point out that even in our tradition of Ksav Ashuri, it's clear from the Gemara and the Menachos that certain, the shapes of certain letters have changed. Um, this may sound strange to some in the audience, but it's clear from the Gemara that most of the Sofran in the, in the Amoraic period were writing their Hays when the leg of the Hay actually touched the God. Now, that might first sound strange at first. You say, oh my goodness, that looks like a ches, but it doesn't, because if you know what a ches looks like, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, Tzad Beis Yosef or not, it's well, whatever, two Zions and a Gog, or Vav and a Zion and a Gog. Yeah. So even if you were to have the hay attached, it still wouldn't look like a ches, but it appears from the Gemara. The good so from separated it, but I think that script itself, you know, can evolve somewhat over time. When you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls is an example. Most of the Dead Sea Scrolls are in Savashuri, but you can see the script. It, it takes a long time to learn to read it. Or even uh, I've shown students the, the what probably is the oldest ma Mishnah manuscript, Savya Kaufman, and sometimes students will look and say, "I can't read this." And I look at them, I don't understand why can't you read it? It's in Syrian script, but it it is a Syrian script. It's not a question about it. The letters are all basically the same. But you can have, and maybe that's just as the script in itself changes. So even if you're switching from from a Paleo Hebrew to uh, to uh, Shavashuri, it may be that that actually doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you and I get to just change the script, but I don't know that that really presents a theological problem. But if someone is deeply prob thinks it's theologically problematic, the answer may lie in the Gemara's suggestion of Sava Nishtavan, that it's Sava Sedishtanos, that it's something that's baked into the system. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Um